Doctor, how are you, sir? Very good, Glenn. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, the what you say is an unconstitutional sham of an impeachment trial. I I don't understand uh, how you can have the the vote in the Senate to uh, convict and remove when he's already removed. Well, this is the whole point, and I'm going to go to the floor in about an hour, and I'm going to force a vote on this today. Republican leadership has made a deal and wants to make a deal with Schumer to allow a Democrat to preside over this hearing. But my point is, if you're impeaching the president, the chief justice needs to be there. Right. But if the person is no longer president, then he's a private citizen. It is an impeachment. If he's if, if someone's committed a crime and they're no longer the president, the Department of Justice has to accuse them of a crime and you go to a court. But this is only for impeaching somebody. And the Constitution says when you impeach and later on you can disqualify, but it's and. It isn't or. Right. So you, if you can't impeach them any longer, we are doing something that has never been done to a president before. It's going to divide the country further. It's a huge mistake. And it belies everything Biden supposedly says about unity. No, this is the most divisive thing I could imagine the Democrats doing at so this point. So tell me, tell me why John Roberts isn't coming and isn't invited. That doesn't, that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Well, here's the question. You know, if reporters were worth their salt, what do you think they ought to ask Schumer today? Did you talk to John Roberts? I guarantee they had a private conversation. I guarantee Schumer called him up, begging him to come over, and he said, well, the Constitution says I preside over an impeachment of the president, and he's not the president. Because the Democrats realize this is going to lessen the legitimacy or call into question the legitimacy of the proceeding. But I guarantee that if they had a conversation, people should be – if reporters were worth anything, they would be pounding Schumer every day saying, did you talk to John Roberts? What did he say? Because John Roberts' opinion here is very important. It goes to the very nature and legitimacy of this thing. And with John, with John Roberts not showing up, the chief justice not being here, I really think that this is an illegitimate process from top to bottom. So does the Constitution say the chief justice has to be seated in that role? For an impeachment of the president. So you could argue that John Roberts is actually right. He shouldn't be here, but by not being here, he's calling into question the proceeding at all. Because there is no call for the impeachment of an ex-president, of a private citizen. So he's either the president or he's not. So he's not the president. So the chief justice shouldn't come. But then it also calls into question the whole idea of doing it. Now, they say, oh, well, we've done this before. Well, the country's been very divided in the past, and no one's ever been convicted. No one's ever tried to try an ex-president because of how it would divide the country, but also because there's no provision for impeaching an ex-president. So... The other argument that I will make today is that if they're talking about inciting violence, there's a few Democrat words that we might want to evaluate. Number one, I was there when the Bernie Sanders supporter almost killed Steve Scalise at the ball mm-hmm. field. He almost killed one of our coaches. And you know what the Democrats were saying at the time? They were saying the Republican plan for health care is you get sick and you die. That to me sounds like an incitement. If you're telling me that the Republicans are going to let me die, you can see how you know there's all these kind of glorified movies of people committing violence when their children are going to die for not having insurance. That is an incitement to violence. But not one Republican ever called for Bernie Sanders to be impeached because we thought that was ludicrous, and it wasn't necessarily his fault that this man reacted violently. But they're going to have a different standard. For the president who said march peacefully to the Capitol, they're going to say, oh, no, that was incitement to violence, and he's responsible. But not Bernie Sanders, not Maxine Waters, not Cory Booker who said get up in their face. So it's a, it's, it's a double standard, and people are going to see it for that. But does it matter anymore? I mean, it seems as though the fix is in between um, big corporations and uh, and government. It just seems like the fix is in. And who cares about double standards anymore? Because nobody nobody ever does anything about it. Nothing changes. Well, the thing is, is I, I'm not one who wants to give up. You know, I know people are very frustrated. People are like, well, you know, if all this fraud happened and nobody's going to do anything, why should I even vote? 
I'm of the opposite opinion. Right. We control 30. We control 35 state legislatures. The Republican Party does. We need to beat those Republicans over the head until they fix the electoral system. I'm already calling people in the Georgia legislature and saying, y'all need to fix it because 2022, the Senate race will be back up again. And you need to fix your system where people can't vote twice, where you purge the rolls and you need to fix it where you cannot solicit people, you cannot use taxpayer money to send out applications to vote. The individual should have to apply for a ballot. MoveOn.org shouldn't be able to apply. Neither should right. the NRA. Right. It should be the individual applying for a ballot. If you change the rules to do that and you get back to show your ID in person, I think there's a possibility we could get back to fair elections, and I am going to keep fighting instead of – but it can't be done in Washington. It never could have been done in Washington. Mm -hmm. It won't be done in Washington. We don't control anything in Washington now, plus those of us who believe in states' rights think that elections should be uh, in the charge of the uh, states. And so – but I, I wouldn't give up on it. We can fight and we should because if they get to where we do all mail-in ballots, we'll become like Oregon and now like Colorado. They do all mail-in ballots there. Who knows who the hell votes in those elections? But guess what? Only Democrats win. I, I will tell you that uh, this is the way I feel. I'm just frustrated in talking about the double standard and pointing out what the news is saying and what they're calling, name calling, because it's like, it's not, nothing's going to stop that. I am with you 100% that we have got to get into our local communities and our states. And people say, well, we can't fix the other states. But don't worry about the other states. Fix yours and shore it up and do everything you can to make sure that it is buttoned up and is, as metaphorically speaking, bulletproof as possible. But the one reason I would say we have to call it the double standard is today, if I don't say anything... Republicans and Democrats will agree by unanimous consent to install a Democrat to preside over this proceeding, right. an illegitimate proceeding with an illegitimate Democrat overseeing it. So I'm going to object to that and call out the double standard, and I, I don't think we'll win. The Democrats will win, but I'm going to force them to vote on it. And my hope is that I get 40 Republicans to vote with me. And if I do, Jeez. that shows they don't have the votes to, to impeach at that point. And so basically the trial is over. They can go through the manipulations. But if 40 of us vote that this is an unconstitutional use of the impeachment power, then they're done. They can do whatever the hell they want, but we will show them that we're going to stand strong. But if I don't do this, our leadership will acquiesce yeah. with Schumer. There will be no vote. And they will go through the whole trial as if this sham is actually a real impeachment. So I'd say we do have to fight them. And I don't know. I'm just not willing to give up on it. I keep fighting them every day, whether they're in my party or in the other party. I keep fighting fight on in a figurative way, Glenn. Make sure we say that right. that fighting is figurative. Yeah. But uh, – so I don't know, but I, we're going to win some battles, and really, uh, come 2022, you're going to find that people are going to be quite unhappy with the unemployment that Biden's going to bring them as well. It's stunning what he is doing and the effects that it will have on the economy. Just stunning that these things are um, these things are happening. Um, Rand, you have an opponent in the uh, Republican Party. Uh, Mitt Romney, who is really pushing hard uh, for it, seemingly pushing hard for this impeachment trial. Um, and it really is only about making sure that Donald Trump can't ever run for office again. Um, do you think you can hold 40 senators together? Yeah, I think we do probably have 40. There's a, you know, we have 48 total. And I'd say there's five or six that have been leaning the other way. But to tell you the truth, some of that five or six have been more critical of the, you know, the uh, policy of trying to overturn the Electoral College and of the president's remarks, you know, trying to get the vice president to intercede, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. And maybe when push comes to shove, and they also think about self-preservation, which you know there are most politicians ultimately do, they may decide that, well, you know what, I don't think this is really constitutional and the best. It gives them an out. They can still criticize the speech. They can criticize the policy. But then they can say, well, do we really want to get into the point of – you know, uh, impeaching former presidents. My friend Thomas Massey, the congressman from Northern Kentucky, tweeted out today. He said, yeah, when we start doing it, line up. I want to do FDR. Let me have FDR. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's just a crazy notion. But no, I think we can. I think we get 40. And if I'm lucky, maybe we get 43, maybe 45 out of the 48. So we won't get Romney. He's already said he thinks it's constitutional. It ought to be done. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple others that may just choose 
to criticize the president on the policy, but may say it's kind of crazy to impeach an ex-president. One last topic I want to talk to you about, and that is, you know, we're hearing from everybody. Uh, we have to deprogram these Trump people. Uh, and and they're also using language that they're domestic terrorists, etc. And it uh, it appears as though I watched the hearing for the uh, head of the Department of Homeland Security. He said domestic terrorism is number one on his agenda. Now, I, I remember the Obama years. I don't think they're talking about the same kind of domestic terrorism that uh, I would talk about. This is one of the problems with the Patriot Act. It can be so easily turned around and used on anybody. Um, You're exactly right. You're exactly right. But here's the good news, Glenn. The good news is the camps that we will be sent to will be run by Katie Couric, and she has that beautiful smile. (laughs) You will just take your Soma, Glenn. It won't hurt so much. Right, right. You take your Soma, you'll drift off into... uh, some sort of opiate sleep, and uh, they will deprogram, reprogram you. you okay, know? so and, it, uh, it, it, it is funny, and that's the way everybody deals with it. Is it at all a reality that this is a direction that they're seriously going in? And I'm not talking about camps, but I'm talking about labeling people like you yeah. or me as domestic yeah. terrorists. Uh, uh, no, absolutely. And I, I don't want to treat it just w- as a joke because the Patriot Act was no joke and they used it not against terrorists. They used it against average ordinary Americans. In fact, not just some average ordinary Americans. Everybody had a cell phone. They, they collected all of our phone calls and then James Clapper lied about it. And so, yes, it is very dangerous to see what happens. And it's always important to read the details of these because – they say, well, if we're going after terrorists, I'm like, well, yeah, I don't like the, you know, the people who blew up the the courthouse in Oklahoma. I'm I'm fine with them getting the death penalty. I'm fine with them being in jail forever. Those are bad, murderous people. You know, that is domestic terrorism. But if domestic terrorism is, you know, according to George Stephanopoulos, I'm sure he thinks I'm a terrorist because mm-hmm. I refuse to accept that there was no fraud in the election. Mm-hmm. So if it becomes an ideological test, I read something scary yesterday that there are people who want to bring back the ideas of sedition, the Alien and Sedition Acts that John Adams put forward, which basically was putting Americans, including one congressman, in jail for their speech. Because people say you don't have a right to misinform people, but then who becomes the judge of what is misinformation and what is true information? This is a scary world they're talking about, so I don't want to downplay it at all. We will have to, but the hard part, as you know, is they're going to point towards some really bad people who committed violence and say, oh, you want to let that happen, and we'll have to be able to um, be good enough in our response to say, no, we're talking about speech, and who's going to be the arbiter of true speech? Yeah. I mean, if you look at the argument between the uh, many of the founders during the Sedition Act, they they argued that you could, as press— they could even lie and make things up. They had a right, and the government had no place uh, in that argument uh, at all to try to shut them down. I mean, they they went as far in their correction of that um, as, I mean, almost to the point of me being kind of uncomfortable uh, when you first hear the ideas until you actually really read them. F- freedom of speech means that. Freedom of speech. And it's a, it's a platitude, but I think it's true that people say the answer for bad speech or disinformation is more speech, not less. But there, there's something profound in that statement in the sense that um, it's an elitist idea to believe that you know if, 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 if you allow Nazis to speak and say hateful thing about people of other races or you allow racists to speak, that somehow there aren't enough of us to combat that, that mm-hmm. somehow we're weak and feeble-minded enough that those ideas will overcome us. Um, I don't think that's true. In fact, I think America is is more accepting uh, um, and more integrated in in thought and race than we've ever been, whether it's churches or marriage. Um, you know, I, half the people I know, and I, you know, I don't know what the percentages, but I know lots of people everywhere around me who are married to people of other races. That's a commonplace thing and a good thing. And uh, we are we are a country that is not a racist country. We are not a country that hates each other. I just get so tired of these people saying what a terrible place America is. 
when in reality, we are better than we have ever been in my lifetime. And gosh, think of the last 200 years, how much better it is to be alive now if you're a person of color or a person of a different faith or if you're a person that is somehow a minority. Maybe you're even a person who wants to teach your kids at home. That's yeah. actually even more acceptable for the just, most part. Just a person. Rand Paul, thank you very much. Senator from Kentucky, Rand Paul, would be looking forward to your uh, speech today.